the feminist movement is one of the most powerful and notable social movements in the history of the United States. The movement is typically divided into three waves, the most well known being the first, which fought for women's suffrage in the 19th and early 20th centuries. While the first wave was brought to the forefront in the 1800s, it would not have been possible if it were not for the powerful words of women prior to the birth of the movement. Oulampe de Gouges of France was a well-established playwright during the French Revolution. During the Revolution, the National Constituent Assembly published the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, which laid out the basic human rights grant to every citizen, however, only males were officially classified as citizens. The document's lack of recognition to women's rights prompted Oulampe to publish the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and the Female Citizen in September of 1791. She repeated the same principles laid out in the original declaration, only now extending these rights to women as well as men. Oulampe's refusal to be silent on such a highly controversial topic ultimately led to her execution by guillotine, and according to reports at the time, she had to be punished for having forgotten the virtues that belonged to her sex. Across the English Channel in 1792, British writer and philosopher Mary Wollstonecraft wrote one of the most passionate pleas for equality with a vindication of the rights of women, in which she made a reasoned argument for justice for women, for the opening of the professions, for sound education, and for an end to the bitter bread of dependence on the male. These women paved the way for the suffragists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, advocating for the dignity of women and pushing forth the belief that the female sex is not naturally inferior to their male counterparts. Life for women during the 1800s was filled with adversity. Throughout the century and reaching into the 20th century as well, many forms of publications such as advice manuals, poetry, literature, sermons, and medical texts reinforced constantly the expected values and characteristics of true womanhood. According to historian Barbara Welter, these true women were to uphold the four core virtues of womanhood. Piety, which was to control women's longings. Purity, as a woman's greatest treasure was her virginity. Submission, because women were seen as naturally subordinate to men. And domesticity, meaning that the perfect woman stayed at home and did her best to make it the perfect refuge for her children and especially her husband. This is referred to as the cult of domesticity. Beyond the cult of domesticity, the average woman gave birth to seven children, higher education for women was forbidden, and while wealthy women had slight authority on the domestic front, most women had no property or economic rights. Women could not vote and they had no rights to their children. Life in this period was even harder for women of color. In her famous speech at a women's rights convention in Akron, Ohio in 1851, former slave Sojourner Truth aired her grievances at the injustices she faced due to her sex and race with her famous Ain't I a Woman speech. Here, actress Carrie Washington reads the powerful speech. That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. <laughs> Nobody ever helps me into carriages <laughs> or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as any man when I could get it. And I could bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children, seen most sold off into slavery. And when I cried out with a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Th th that man in the back there, he says, women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. <laughs> well, where did your Christ come from? <laughs> where did your Christ come from. He came from God and a woman. Man didn't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, well, these women here together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. <laughs> and they ask him to do it. The men better let them. The temperance and abolition movements helped to mobilize women in their search for equality at this time. It was at the World Anti-Slavery Convention of 1840 where Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott first met. After the convention voted to actively exclude women, allowing them only to sit quietly in a curtained enclosure, 
at the meetings, Stanton, Mott, and others devised arrangements for the first women's right convention in history at Seneca Falls, New York. Approximately 300 women and even some men came to the conference. It was here that a Declaration of Sentiments was signed by 68 women and 32 men, mirroring the terminology of the Declaration of Independence, only this time extending the vocabulary not only to encompass men, but women as well. According to historian Howard Zinn, a list of grievances followed the Declaration of Sentiments, which included women's lack of a right to vote, to wages or property, no rights in cases of divorce, no equal opportunity of employment, and no entrance to higher education institutions. Many conventions followed the original one at Seneca Falls, attracting men and women of both races. Following these conventions, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony formed the American Equal Rights Association in 1866. Consisting of white and black men and women, the association called for universal suffrage. Two years later, the 14th Amendment was passed, which officially defined voters as male. Following this development in 1869, disagreements arose within the movement, causing it to be split into two factions. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton organized the more radical-leaning National Women's Suffrage Association in New York. On the other end of the spectrum, Henry Blackwell, Lucy Stone, and Julia Ward Howe formed the more conservative-leaning American Suffrage Association in Boston. Many leaders of the feminist suffragist movement unsuccessfully attempted to vote during this time. Virginia Louisa Minor fought in the courts for the right to vote under the 14th Amendment and failed, alongside Victoria Woodhull, who later became the first woman to run for president. Susan B. Anthony was arrested and went to trial for attempting to vote for Louisus Grant in Rochester, New York, and Sojourner Truth attempted to vote in Battle Creek, Michigan, but was subsequently turned away. However, a woman's suffrage amendment was introduced in the United States Congress in 1878, and the following year the NWSA and AWSA were reunited under Elizabeth Cady Stanton. In the early 20th century, many other organizations arose to promote women's suffrage. After the anti-suffrage group the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage was organized, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns formed the more radical National Women's Party in 1913. The National Women's Party borrowed tactics from the radical and controversial Women's Social and Political Union Group of England. They participated in hunger strikes, picketed the White House, and partook in other forms of civil disobedience in order to publicize and bring attention to the group's cause. Even though many states had already granted women the right to vote, the 19th Amendment was passed on August 26, 1920. Women were now allowed to vote, the amendment stating, The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. After winning the right to vote, the first wave of feminism ended on a very victorious note.